morning. Uh, namaskar and very good afternoon esteemed guests distinguished speakers participants ladies and gentlemen my name is shikha and on uh, behalf of sigre india and cbip it's my honor to welcome you to this international tutorial on technology selection and specification of hvdc and protection and local control of hvdc grids under the aegis of sigre national committee b4 on dc systems and power electronics uh, we are honored to have with us today uh, shri ak arora ji national representative in sigre study committee b4 and executive director hvdc from power grid corporation of india limited mr Bu bruno from canada and uh, 
he is the faculty for today's tutorial. Mr. Keith Corman from Netherlands and Mr. William Lechenem from Belgium, who is the faculty for day two of the tutorial. So as you know that today's tutorial will be 90 minute session, including question and answer session at the end. Uh, we have requested our faculties to take their questions at the end of their presentation. Participants may also send their queries to SIGRE India uh, for forwarding the same to the speakers for their response after the tutorial. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, SIGRE, as you know, is a unique platform to share practical experiences. Before I invite Mr. A.K. Bhatnagarji, Director SIGRE India and CBIP for welcome address, we would like to display a film about SIGRE for the benefits of the participants who are not uh, much familiar with the activities of the SIGRE. So I request uh, your kind attention, please. Our IT team will display the SIGRE promotional film prepared by SIGRE India. So I request our IT team to kindly display the film now. SIGRE, the International Council on Large Electrical Systems, is World Forum for Power System, founded on November 22, 1921 at Paris. SIGRE deals with the issues related to the development, operation and management of electric power systems as well as design, construction, maintenance of equipments and plants. Mission of SIGRE is to promote and organize in collaboration with experts from all around the world by sharing knowledge and joining forces to improve the electric power systems of today and tomorrow. It mainly aims on coordination of research, exchange of experience, scientific and technical information on the operation and design of electric power systems. SIGRE is an association that promotes the exchange of latest generation of technical knowledge regarding electricity and bringing innovative ideas to support the industry needs. SIGRE has worldwide network of experts from ministries, generating companies, transmission and system operations, distribution operators, regulators, manufacturers and academies. It has gained international representation in nearly 90 countries through national committees in order to provide opportunities or improvement of services supplied to the society. SIGRE has 16 national committees, 95 member countries, more than 10,000 individuals and more than 1,000 organizational members. SIGRE strategic direction are best use of existing system, unbiased information for all stakeholders, environment and sustainability, and future power systems. The challenges are renewable energy sources, growing environmental requirements, limitations to build new transmission infrastructures, architecture of networks, operation of existing power systems, transmission of large amount of power over long distances, cyber security, and intermittency of renewable power generation. SIGRE operates through 16 committees on different subjects having members from various countries. These committees are divided into four groups. Group A, Equipment and the Study Committees are A1, Rotating Electrical Machines A2, Transformers A3, High Voltage Equipment Group B, Technologies and the Study Committees are B1, Insulated Cables Overhead Lines, Substations HVDC and Power Electronics B5 Protection and Automation Group C Systems and the Study Committees are C1 System Development and Economics System Operation and Controls System Environmental Performance System Technical Performance 
electricity markets and regulation, distributed system and dispersed generation. Group D, new materials and IT and the study committees are materials and emerging test techniques, information systems and telecommunication. The study committee of SIGRE has about 250 working groups which produce nearly 50 technical brochures per year. The work carried out in SIGRE environment is considered as reverence being applied to the development of technical standards. SIGRE develops technical knowledge using two main methods, conferencing and meetings, where papers are presented and discussed and studies carried out by study committees through the work of international working groups on identified industry issues. SIGRE has recently started a series of science and engineering journal. Six issues have been published in 2015-16. SIGRE has started a series of new publications named Green Books. The books on the following subjects are already released. Accessories for HV extruded cables, overhead lines, and utility communication network and services. So, why is it especially profitable to join SIGRE activities? Joining a SIGRE working group as an expert always results in a high return for your organization as well as for yourself, all the more so for a young engineer. You become part of a worldwide network of experts with whom you discuss current issues, share international experience and benchmark your own practices. You are in a position to promote your ideas and weigh on the contents of specifications, recommendations and future standards. Experts represent all the profiles of the power industry, hence a wealth of opportunities to start cooperation between university and industry, between industry and administration, etc. At a personal level, you are in contact with other cultures, practices, working methods. You acquire knowledge through working and experienced experts. National international teamwork and practice of technical English enhance your personal development. New generation networks. National committee of countries like UK, US, Australia, New Zealand, etc. have created a next generation network NGN that aims to develop the next generation of power engineering professionals. SIGRE is present in India since 1971. Since its foundation, SIGRE India helps the country to deal with its challenges in the areas of electricity and demonstrates the strength of the Indian power system engineering worldwide. The SIGRE India brings together top experts spread across 16 minor study committees at national level. The dissemination of consolidated knowledge is done through publications and national and international workshops, seminars, symposia, etc. So, get associated with this unique organization and take maximum advantage of this forum for accentuating the knowledge in electric power system. Now, without uh, further delay, may I invite Sri A.K. Bhatnagarji, Director, SIGRE India and CBIP to deliver welcome address. Sir, please. Thank you, Shikha. Thank you. I welcome you all on this online tutorial on technology selection and specification of HD, HVDC and production and local control of HVDC grids being organized by SIGRE India under the aegis of SIGRE National Study Committee NSC P4 on DC system and power return. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very challenging period and we are trying to make best use of this challenging period by not leaving behind the learning process. So in the endeavor to, to learn more, we have joined hands and being supported by this committee of SIGRE uh, NSC P4. I am glad to share with you the excellent support and help extended to SIGRE India in achieving its objective 
or dissemination of knowledge effectively during this pandemic situation the sigre committee through the various presentation and specifically for this bfo presentation of tutorial mr bruno bizwiski from canada is joining head with us welcome sir welcome on this program mr kinis corben uh, from netherland you are welcome to this program sir tutorial program and mr willem letpren for belgium on hvdc sir you are also welcome on this tutorial and we have with us mr anil kumar arora ji who is chairman sigre national study committee before and also executive director engineering hvdc power grid welcome to you mr arora thank you for so much for your continuous support to this group and we you, you are we everybody knows that you are a very eminent professional in this subject and supporting and guiding activities relating to national study committee on b4 as its chairman i welcome you mr i am grateful to all the participants and their organization who has sponsored them or allowed them to participate in this training program you are all welcome and i request them to join sigre as its member and connect with global power system <coughs> community so there is a great learning and with this i welcome mr arora uh, to take over please thank you thank you very much thank you mr batnagar thank you very much for inviting me and uh, good welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for two day tutorial sigre as you all know is a unique platform for sharing experience and accentuating knowledge so i am currently representing sigre study group scb4 on dc systems and power electronics though the current pandemic situation has affected the activities in almost all area sigre india and we as sigre national committee on dc system and power electronics have planned series of five tutorial in this year with the support of study committee before and madam johanu who chair person of the study committee before and they have ex excellently supported us for this venture by arranging eminent expert for delivering the tutorials besides this to boost the activities of nsc before further we are also in the process of constituting a national committee on the subject drawing experts from various organizations those who wish to contribute and join the national committee before may kindly contact me through sigre india i would also like to request all the participants to get associated with sigre as member through sigre india this will provide you great benefit in accentuating your knowledge and also give you opportunity for exposure at international levels mr bruno bisevski from canada Mr. Kees Corman from Netherlands and Mr. William Netterme from Belgium are the eminent expert on the subject. Are here with us to share their knowledge and their experience through their tutorial. So I am sure you will take advantage of the tutorial we are conducting for today and tomorrow. And first and the foremost thing I would like to add that this tutorial will be so useful from the point of view of finalizing the technology and the specification. These are the two very challenging area in today's scenario. as we all know that vsc technology is the new technology and earlier we were having lcc technology so both the technologies have their advantages of one over the other so in one technology you have some uh, losses are little lesser in comparison to the other technology like uh, from lcc to vsc and like in vscc you have little higher losses but you have an advantage that you can have a black start in vsc technology and in addition you have several advantages of both the technologies in different arena it all depends upon where you are going to utilize it so there is a big challenge that which technology we we should adopt in under which circumstances like if you take the country scenario our most of the power which is coming up in our country is in renewable that means either it will be solar or it will be primarily on wind and the technology which will be very useful for these kind of setups because these projects are usually installed at a very remote locations so vsc is the prime technology which can be utilized for this renewable energy power evacuation systems so vsc will be very much prevalent in our country in coming in the coming days and it has a very good future in future also so that is why my humble submission to all the participants is to give your valuable time and interact with the faculties because they are the authorities in their area so that they can imbibe the knowledge to you for your benefit for future 
moreover there are certain more areas on which the faculties have a very vast experience primarily on uh, statcom uh, fsc tcsc and uh, other other uh, technologies which helps you in dynamic voltage control as well as loading of the lines and etc because these are the area which are very innovative and helps you out in evacuation of power and stabilizing the system also since the faculties have a very thorough knowledge of the of the entire system whether it is uh, hudc technology or it is uh, statcom or reactive power control etc so my submission to all the participants is that please be sincere enough in joining the lectures for both the days and take this opportunity to get yourself educated as much as possible with that i thank once again sigre Uh, Mr. Bhatnagar and other Sigre team in India who has organized, who are organ taking all pain in organizing these lectures for the benefit of all of us. Thank you very much. And now, I give, uh, I request uh, Sigre India to please carry on with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the very informative and educative address. Before I invite Mr. Bruno to deliver the tutorial, I would like to introduce Mr. Bruno to the participants. He is an uh, HVDC and EHV AC specialist with more than 35 years of experience in all aspects of electrical transmission industry. Uh, he has a wide experience in front-end engineering system studies and equipment design studies. Preparation of specification, calculation of electrical effect, design review, cost estimates, tender evaluation, and negotiation, equipment testing, and commissioning of AC and HVDC transmission system. Mr. Bruno has worked on many HVDC projects in all aspects from front end engineering and post uh, project conceptualization down to design review. factory uh, testing and detailed design including development of specialized software for hvdc studies and design he has also provided engineering uh, services for implementation of reactive compensation and fax project including ac line series capacitors and shunt reactors svc satcom and Condensator. Uh, so I request uh, Mr. Bruno to kindly start uh, with his presentation now, sir. Please. Hello. Hello, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, sir, it's visible. It's visible, and uh, you can also see me. Uh, first of all, good uh, good, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining the uh, tutorial, and uh, we're very pleased to be here. And on behalf of Seagrade to deliver this tutorial, and uh, <clears throat> thanks to Seagrade India for inviting us and giving us this. Uh, Opportunity to share knowledge and to participate in this international tutorial. Uh, so, with that, uh, I, I will get going. I think we have limited time, and the tutorial is quite long, but I will try to get through it in the in the time available. So, uh, if the screen is visible, the uh, topic of my presentation this morning is the. Uh, The uh, HVDC planning, technology selection, and specification, and uh, we'll go right into it. And my topics in my presentation are owners' planning, uh, technology selection considerations, and specifications. Uh, first, uh, going into owners planning. Uh, so the owners planning uh, really consists of planning studies. First of all, feasibility studies to show that the DC is uh, 
going to work and uh, is uh, the uh, optimal technology for transmission of the power. Uh, load flow studies uh, and primarily uh, to show that the, the DC system works with the AC system and to identify AC system upgrade requirements. Transient stability studies uh, whose objective is to determine overload uh, requirements uh, Supplement uh, and to define, if necessary, supplementary controls and modulations, could, which could include power oscillation, damping, frequency limiter, fast power transfer between poles, run back, run up, uh, uh, coordination with generator tripping, and under frequency load shedding. Uh, short circuit studies that's to determine the uh, equivalent short circuit ratio and get an idea of how well your, your DC, especially in LCC, will operate in the AC system, and to determine unit interaction factors, UIF, to determine the susceptibility to SSDI of certain generators in the system. And once they're identified, they can be studied in detail at the time that the DC is being designed. Uh, harmonic impedance studies, uh, for obvious reasons, to uh, needed for filter design, and uh, reliability assessment to assess the need uh, primarily for major spares in the in the HVDC. Uh, with a reliability assessment, you can decide whether or not it makes mo uh, economic uh, 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 advantage to buy major spares or or to accept the outage uh, as as a uh, consequence of not having the spare. And of course, system equivalents for performance demonstrations during the bid and and the contract. And those equivalents are primarily uh, equivalents that are used in uh, PSCAD uh, uh, dynamic performance studies and RTDS uh, performance studies. Other uh, owners' investigations uh, include the site selection. Of course, it's good to place the site in the optimal location uh, near the uh, in, in, in appropriate buses in the AC system and in good environmental areas so that they are uh, safe from uh, flooding and, and that kind of thing. Uh, so there's environmental planning and permitting, preliminary geotechnical investigations on the sites, background harmonic measurements, telephone interference assessments, and that's primarily to identify how many open wire or cable telecommunication telephone circuits are adjacent to the DC and the AC lines near the converter stations. And there's just been a very uh, good uh, uh, new uh, technical brochure released uh, from Seagray, technical brochure 811, which deals with uh, telephone interference and uh, uh, from HVDC lines in, in great detail and uh, summarizes all the knowledge that uh, practically is available there, thanks to Seagrave uh, uh, for, for, for providing that. And uh, in the HVDC line design, of course, needs to be done pr uh, prior to the specification so that you have the parameters of the line to include in the specification so that the DC designers can design the HVDC system, a line and or cable routing for the H HVDC system, and electrode site selection if you're going to put in electrodes. Uh, next, we'll move into technology selection. And there, first look at uh, several topics in that, in that area, available technology, uh, of course, LCC and VSC, factors that may dictate one option over the other, LCC or VSC, performance, and cost and other factors. Uh, so looking at available technology, and this is uh, in, in two columns. Uh, on the left, you have LCC technology, uh, switching devices available, electrically uh, tri uh, triggered uh, thyristors, light triggered thyristors, uh, ratings up to 8.5 kV, 4,000 amps, uh, converter configurations, 6 pulse and 12 pulse. 6 pulse is relatively rare now, and 12 pulse is, is the, uh, the standard now, but in the early days, 6 pulse was quite common. Uh, switching for 
circuit configuration is done with uh, high speed commutating switches, basically SF6 breakers with auxiliary components to, to generate current zeros and then allow interruption of DC uh, currents or uh, actually commutation of the current into another path. Uh, and of course, disconnectors. Uh, looking at VSC technology, uh, you have switching devices, primarily I IGBTs or IEGTs uh, with freewheeling diodes, ratings up to 4.5 kV and 2500 amps in use. 6.5 kV is on the horizon. I think GE is now using 6.5 kV I IGBTs. Um, uh, converter configurations, MMC. Half, uh, primarily the, the technology now in use, you, and they can be configured as half bridge converters, uh, full bridge converters, uh, hy or hybrid converters, which have both half bridge and full bridge modules in the valve arms. Uh, there's also an older configuration that was used uh, in, the, uh, in this immediate, immediately at the start of the uh, VSC technology that was uh, cascaded two level converters. The technology is, uh, I understand, no longer being offered, and it was similar to the half bridge technology in the MMC. So, switching for circuit reconfiguration is again similar to LCC. Uh, you can use high speed commutating switches for areas where you don't need to or where you can commutate the current. You don't need to interrupt uh, fault current disconnectors for switching when the, there's no current. And DC breakers, uh, bo both electronic and hybrid, electronic and, and mechanical, which can be used to actually uh, interrupt DC current. So looking at what kind of circuit configurations are possible with uh, each of the technologies, LCC and VSC, uh, you can see that uh, if you do a comparison uh, bipole with ground return available in both technologies or can be done in both technologies. It's the most common configuration for, for HV, HVDC and LCC. Uh, in VSC, uh, the most common uh, configuration till now has been the symmetric monopole, but uh, that is also changing as the rating power ratings go up and, and I think bipolar with ground return or bipolar with DMR may become the, the, the more uh, common technologies. So, uh, so, of course, there's a symmetric monopole used mainly with uh, VSC uh, up until this point. There are, there are a few projects, though, uh, with uh, LCC as well. Rigid bipole, uh, which is an interesting configuration because it doesn't uh, use either uh, metallic return or ground return. Uh, but instead uh, requires that you take a short outage if you have a pole fault and then switch the other the remaining pole to the other line if it's uh, not uh, com completely grounded and uh, you can continue operation then in monopolar with uh, ground re uh, with uh, met metallic return on the other line pole uh, asymmetric monopole uh, with a, with a DMR. Uh, that's not a very common configuration uh, because uh, it requires that you have a full voltage uh, cable on or or line on 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 one side. Uh, whereas with the symmetric monopole, you you have basically half the voltage on on the, on on each cable or 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 line conductor. Uh, asymmetric monopole with uh, ground return, uh, again, similar configuration to the configuration with the dedicated metallic return. Uh, Multi-terminal configurations are possible with either technology. Uh, it's, uh, there are examples of systems with multi-terminal uh, in the world in both technologies. Uh, parallel converters are, of course, uh, common uh, in both technologies and very useful for increasing the rating uh, of the the system beyond the rating of a single switching device or a thyristor or IGBT. And uh, of course, series converters are, are possible in, in both technologies as well. Uh, factors that might uh, drive the selection of LCC or VSC. Uh, looking at LCC converters first on the left, uh, 
LCC converters have the lowest cost. Uh, they're, if you're looking at uh, uh, equal uh, power transmission capability, uh, they're significantly cheaper, especially if you uh, have a power breakpoint where it becomes necessary to add perhaps a, a second VSC converter to get the same rating, then, then the, the, the cost difference can be quite significant. Uh, LCC converters have minimum losses. They're, um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, looking at the losses, numbers that are usually given are for an LCC converter at full load, the uh, the losses may be in the order of about 0.7% of the transmitted power at each converter station. So 1.5% uh, losses on the on the uh, both converter stations at the two ends. Whereas with uh, VSC, the, the losses may be in the order of 1% uh, at full power. And then uh, you're looking at, uh, for both stations, uh, losses uh, in the converters of about 2%. So that's a quite a significant difference when you have a very high power link. Uh, LCCs are much more suitable for very high power links, uh, for, for instance, greater than 2,500 megawatts. Uh, LCC converters have typically quite a high capability for short time overload, which is important if you have a system where, uh, you know, short time interruptions uh, may mean that uh, there's a stability problem and then you need to bring the DC back uh, power back uh, very fast and, and very hard to, to try and uh, overcome that stability problem. Then the short time overload um, may be a very useful thing. It's really not available with VSC, which are typically operated right at their limit and have very limited, if any, overload unless you uh, pay for it uh, directly. Uh, LCC is also very good at isolating AC and DC faults because the fault clearing on the DC side is is uh, is very uh, very fast. And also LCC is very fast, uh, gives very fast recovery from DC line faults, as well as uh, repeated, uh, the ability to provide repeated uh, fault clearing followed by overloading uh, to bring the uh, system stability back in control. So those are the reasons that you might consider LCC converters. Uh, looking at VSC converters, uh, if you have very long land cables, uh, it's possible to use um, cheaper, uh, say, um, extruded cables, which uh, may not have capability for uh, voltage reversals uh, with VSC because VSC converters inherently don't allow vol uh, voltage reversals because of the freewheeling diode. So the cables uh, can be cheaper. Uh, that is changing now as, as cables uh, technology is improving. But uh, still, uh, I think an applicable uh, consideration. Uh, where the, the overhead line is not possible, possibly due to limited right of way or severe pollution or environmental opposition, regulatory requirements, uh, and you, do, you then opt for a cable, then you may have a uh, the only way that it can be done. And the, of course, with VSC converters, with with the the cables uh, being uh, cheaper, it would be uh, obviously an advantage to go with VSC in that scenario. If you have limited space for converter stations, you would consider VSC because VSC converters don't include uh, very large filters. So the, uh, the space requirement uh, for the stations is quite a lot smaller than for LCC converters. Uh, VSC converters are also relatively Im immune to commutation failure and can ride through events that uh, would basically um, cause a complete interruption of an LCC uh, power transfer. And the, the, LC, the VSC might still be able to transmit some power through, uh, for instance, single line to ground faults, whereas uh, an LCC, the power transfer is not very high at all. Um, and of course, as already mentioned earlier, uh, v, uh, VSC gives you the possibility of system restoration because it has black start capability, uh, which is very difficult to do with uh, with LCC unless you provide um, synchronous condensers and uh, other 
very specialized equipment to uh, allow a, a restoration or a startup in a, in a black system. So looking then, uh, trying to summarize all of that and, and looking at an applicability matrix for LCC and VSC, uh, uh, we look at first uh, what are the kinds of uh, applications you can use a, a DC in, for instance, uh, in a back-to-back -back scenario uh, where you're connecting two systems either of different frequencies or where you don't need to uh, provide a DC line because the AC bus is already uh, can, strong enough and can carry the power. Uh, then uh, LCC and BSC are both uh, applicable. Uh, there may be some advantage on VSC because they have uh, integral, integral reactive power control, whereas with LCC, you've still got to provide uh, AC filters and uh, um, shunt capacitors for uh, switch shunt capacitors for reactive power control for long distance transmission. Either case, you can use LCC or VSC, even in the case of overhead lines uh, for connecting isolated systems. Again, you can use either LCC or VSC. Connecting offshore wind, the most suitable is LCC because, uh, or v, uh, less suitable than VSC because with LCC, you need something to uh, provide a system uh, voltage supply or voltage source. Whereas with uh, the L uh, VSC, of course, you can use a grid forming converter and, and it, be it becomes a system a frequency setting terminal and, and also uh, makes the, uh, the the AC voltage so that your your offshore wind can start and uh, it immediately takes the power away. Uh, for frequency changers, yes, you can use either technology, overhead lines, either technology. Uh, LCC, uh, LCC has the advantage there because it has very fault, uh, inherently very f fast uh, fault clearing through control action. Uh, for VSC, it requires that either that you provide a full bridge technology, hybrid technology, or half bridge plus DC breaker technology if you want very fast clearing. Uh, for cable systems, uh, either technology can be used with cables. Uh, for LCC, it's primarily uh, MI, MI, PPL, and uh, oil field cables. And for BSC, you can use any cable type uh, as well as extruded cables. Uh, Multi-terminal operation, easily possible with both technologies. A uh, little more difficult with LCC and maybe uh, more limited. Uh, most of the uh, multi-terminal operation with uh, LCC so far have been limited to about three terminals uh, and there are uh, I think some VSC uh, systems now with uh, up to five terminals and operating very well. For very high power, LCC still has the advantage, uh, but VSC is under development uh, and it will re very shortly reach, I think, the same level of uh, power that you're getting with uh, uh, LCC. And for system recovery services, uh, Reactive power, uh, black start. Uh, LCC is really uh, not as flexible there as as VSC, so the advantage there is uh, with VSC. So, looking at uh, performance uh, matrix, uh, you'll see that for most of the items, uh, you know, the gold star in performance, uh, except for a few items, is still LCC. It has a uh, very good DC fault interruption capability. Uh, easily uh, best at decoupling DC faults from the AC system. It has fast DC line uh, recovery, uh, fault, uh, fault recovery. Uh, can do many repetitive recovery attempts if, if, if necessary without overloading. Uh, not not able to provide reactive power support uh, during DC fault clearing, except to the extent that the uh, shunt capacitors and AC filters uh, remain connected. That's actually a disadvantage in some cases because the overvoltage may be high and some may need to be tripped or you may need to 
put in other over voltage limiting. Um, then of course, uh, DOV uh, limiting during fault recovery is, is poor because you need to trip uh, sh sh reactive power and then can reconnect it. Uh, you can use re reduced voltage uh, operation due to pollution with uh, MMC hybrids and MMC full bridge, not so not so easily with half bridge technology. Uh, as far as demonstrated uh, service history, uh, LCC is uh, many 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 years of experience, and the other technologies uh, of of the other technologies half bridge is is got some experience. Uh, MMC hybrid, uh, probably only demonstration projects. MMC full bridge, uh, a few projects. Uh, electronic uh, DC breaker, uh, maybe one project or, or a couple of projects, and of course demonstration. And uh, MMC hybrid with DC breaker. Uh, I, I'm not sure if there's any projects that have been developed yet, but uh, it's definitely feasible. As far as uh, increasing short circuit level with LCC, it clearly doesn't provide any capability to increase the short circuit level, except perhaps uh, if you consider that uh, the delta transformers may increase uh, line to ground short circuit levels, but that isn't any help in performance. Uh, all of the VSC technologies can deliver some increase in short circuit uh, performance up to the load current uh, of the DC. Um, system. So looking at the uh, the notes, uh, you can see more stars in, 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 in denotes better performance. Zero uh, indicates not applicable. Uh, next, we'll move on to the technical specification. And uh, I just want to put in a, a little plug saying that the, the greatest source of contract disputes, change orders and cost increase claims is, is an inadequate specification. So it's uh, really worthwhile to do a good job on the specification. And that means doing a lot of work uh, by the owner, in fact. And the uh, idea that you can take and put all the studies off onto the DC supplier and make the DC supplier produce all of your studies is, is, is in, some, in some ways fundamentally not correct or, or lacking because uh, you know that you know your system better than anyone else and uh, uh, you're in the best position to do those kind of front end studies and and, and the studies for um, things like uh, supplementary control systems and uh, rating and other things that we're going to cover here and uh, so the owner really uh, it's in his own best interest uh, to do those studies well, and that will end up with a, a good specification, a specification that both the supplier and the owner can can uh, follow easily, uh, more easily, and and uh, everyone knows what needs to be delivered, and the project goes much better. And so, looking at the topics that are covered in this in this section, uh, first of all, we look at the purpose of the HVDC system. Uh, general requirements, contracting strategy, contract to scope and interfaces, owner studies, active power transfer ratings, continuous ratings and short time overload, transient performance, fault recovery, low voltage ride through, uh, reliability availability, emission limits, and commissioning trial operation, reliability availability verification. So looking at uh, an overall view of what the spec, the first, first thing that you try to describe is what is the purpose and, and need for the uh, DC link? And generally the need is for energy transfer rather than capacity. Uh, usually generators are used for capacity and, and uh, but to, to in, in some cases also an HVDC link can be considered as capacity in the receiving system. If the DC system has to provide uh, equivalent of generator capacity, then the reliability and availability design targets may need to be higher. And 
But things like partial capability and overload capability, uh, especially when you lose a pole, is, is much more important. This could figure, uh, affect the configuration and the redundancy that you would specify. For instance, it may mean that you uh, specify a bipole or two monopoles rather than a single monopole or symmetric monopole. And so the idea is to provide a description of the posed, proposed HVDC link, including the, the lines, neutral or electrode lines, and, and the electrodes, if applicable. Uh, looking at the contractor scope, first, uh, the contractor can't be aware of what the scope is unless he's informed. So, you know, the, you know, there's a uh, there's a philosophy that you can get what you need by specifying uh, a very functional spec, and to some extent that's true, but it's usually better and and far less um, divisive and and there's far less, uh, let's say, disagreement uh, between owner and contractor. If as far as possible, you list all of the facilities, the studies and the services to be provided by the contractor, and it, as far as you can define them, you can always add a catch-all clause later uh, saying, such as including all the necessary items for a fully functional specific uh, installation. Uh, you should list and describe facilities and services to be provided by the owner. You should define all the interfaces between the contractor and the owner, and even if there's interfaces between other contractors and the HVDC contractors, to as much uh, detail as possible. The more information that you put into the specification in this regard, the fewer the uh, uh, opportunities for, for later um, disagreement and, and possible cost increases. And uh, so it's highly recommended that uh, you do a good job uh, on defining the, the scope and the interfaces. So then uh, once you know what you want to buy, then you can look at what should be the contracting strategy. Uh, and there's two main types of contracts that have been traditionally used with, with HVDC. Uh, uh, systems, turnkey with minimal oversight, uh, and turnkey with owner review and approval, which is currently, and, and I think for most part, the most common, especially if the owner has some capability uh, in engineering and, and uh, knows how uh, he wants that the DC to perform and, 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 and to interface with his AC system. Then looking at contract conditions, uh, the most frequent, uh, most frequently, the owner already has a set of uh, large uh, contract uh, uh, contractual conditions, and he may choose to apply those for his, D his DC uh, project. If he doesn't, uh, the uh, International Federation of Consulting Engineers has prepared uh, conditions of contract uh, for EPC contracts and conditions for design, build, and all. And, and operate contracts, uh, they suggest that if you do modify the conditions, and, and typically you need to modify the conditions and add uh, special conditions of contract, you modify them, but try to adhere to the principles of, of uh, sticking by the, the, the principles that the original document, such as the silver book or the gold book, uh, was written uh, around. That way, there will be less uh, uh, contradictions and and uh, bas basically less contradictions and and more uh, co coherent theme. So, looking at uh, then the, the the specification of the DC equipment, uh, general requirements, uh, equipment lifetime is normally 30 years. Some people use 40 years. And, and DC systems, uh, for the most part, uh, much of the power equipment can uh, last for up, up to 40 years. Some of it, of course, will fail and needs to be replaced, but uh, 30 to 40 years is common. Uh, then there's a choice of standards, IEC, IEEE, Seeger guides, and, and national standards. Uh, IEC is the most common and, and generally uh, most up-to-date or current for, for DC systems. 
Um, there are some uh, IEEE standards which shouldn't be overlooked because to some extent uh, the IEEE standards were prepared with more of a utility bias rather than a supplier bias. And, and there may be some good um, material in, in some of the standards which uh, could be applicable. Uh, if, if you don't find it in the standard, uh, sometimes uh, CGRI guides are, are more, up to, uh, more up to date than, than, than some of the standards because there's always a lag between um, sort of uh, development and, and um, the development of the standard. And uh, you, you may in some cases um, refer to a CGRI guide or a technical brochure if it's not covered by the standard. And of course, uh, some standards are adapted for local conditions, and uh, that is uh, certainly true uh, for, for countries like India, which have a significant body of standards, uh, some of which are, are, are quite similar to the IEC standards, but there may be some local content there that uh, shouldn't be ignored. Uh, you should then uh, decide what are the testing requirements for the equipment. Uh, some some uh, owners uh, don't require any new type tests. Others like to um, have type tests and witness type tests and routine tests. Uh, that's something that's uh, more or less a uh, an owner uh, preference. We always recommend to to uh, use type testing. So uh, or or to to to. Uh, have uh, a certain amount of type testing for quality control, uh, contract terms we've already discussed, uh, and then you're looking at special conditions of contract. Uh, you're looking at whether you need to have contract guarantees. Some, um, some of the more commonly specified uh, contract guarantees include uh, penalties or, or let's say, uh, uh, in enhancements or maybe some inducements for achieving schedule on time uh, or if a penalty in the case you don't achieve schedule, failure to achieve ratings has to be, uh, there'd, there'd be some penalty assigned for that in the contract. Uh, penalty for uh, not, uh, not reaching the guaranteed losses, uh, penalty for not, uh, or, or remedy I guess for not uh, achieving reliability and availability and also for failure rate, uh, excessive failure rates of switching devices or failure rates of uh, capacitors or any any device where there's a large uh, number count of, of devices which can fail and which will uh, cause uh, both outages and maintenance costs. So for the specification, uh, what are the general information requirements? Uh, First, the system description, the AC system description, uh, the DC system description as already uh, mentioned, the site location and access, scope and interfaces already discussed, uh, site ambient weather conditions, site electrical conditions, performance requirements, equipment and testing requirements, control and protection requirements, document documentation and training requirements, required guarantees and warranties, contractual conditions, and then usually tables are provided uh, so that technical information can be uh, provided by the bidders uh, so that when you're uh, reviewing the bid, you can make a decision uh, based on the uh, quality of the uh, equipment being provided. So looking at site information, uh, main uh, uh, things are site ambient, uh, climatic characteristic, location and access, transportation limitations, temperature range, uh, including the temperature for power rating guarantee, maximum 24 hour uh, average temperature for lifetime calculation of transformers and hotspots, uh, wind speeds, rainfall and snowfall amounts, including um, monthly, yearly, and uh, you know, one hour, three hour amounts, uh, and so that the uh, site drainage can be uh, designed. Insulator pollution levels, um, seismic withstand requirements, 
and any other environmental conditions or hazards that need to be covered uh, in the design. Uh, so having specified that, we can move on to DC configurations. And so first looking at uh, operating configurations, uh, assuming point-to-point -point transmissions without parallel converters or parallel HVDC systems, the owner should specify all of the required uh, configurations. Symmetric monopole only has one configuration. Uh, basically, it operates uh, when it's on or off. Uh, bipole ground return using electrodes, of course, the, uh, that may have um, monopolar operation, bipolar operation, uh, uh, bipole with dedicated metallic return, similar rigid bipole. With the rigid bipole, requires a fast stop and switch to monopolar metallic return on the other pole conductor if you have a, po uh, a pole fault. And then, of course, there's monopole with ground return using electrodes, monopole with uh, de dedicated metallic return, monopolar with metallic return on the other pole, or the, the third, the, another variant is monopole with both the DMR and the metallic return on the other pole uh, to uh, result in even lower losses. So, and then also in, you look at operating modes and the most usual operating modes are bipole power control, pole synchronous current control individually in each pole, uh, pole separate power control during communication outages, pole reduced voltage mode, and reduced voltage is, is something that's uh, very useful if you have uh, polluted insulators and uh, the west end of the line is not up to full voltage. Frequently by reducing the voltage to between 80 and 70 percent, you can continue operation and uh, uh, you don't have a complete outage and the, the DC will withstand without over without uh, further flashovers. And uh, then for, for testing the line, uh, uh, there's an open line test mode that's possible, should also be specified. Less common operating modes, especially with LCC, uh, is a round power mode in which the power in the LCC system can be in opposite directions in each pole. That way you can adjust an LCC to reach zero power if necessary. Otherwise, the LCC has to operate at some minimum uh, current, which implies a minimum power, especially if, if, if it's a large system and has a bipole and you're running both poles. That can mean that you have a, a, a power offset or non-dispatched non power offset in a system, which can be troublesome if, if the contracts are not uh, friendly to that kind of uh, restriction. Uh, but uh, when operating in round power mode, uh, you have the same voltage polarity uh, in each pole. It increases the electric field. And uh, also it's uh, sometimes difficult to decide when you should use round power and when you shouldn't. So uh, it's something that you can consider, but uh, not, not often uh, used. Ratings. Uh, so what ratings should you specify for an LCC system? Uh, basically, uh, you look at the nominal continuous rating, uh, which is the basic rating without redundant cooling. You could look at the, you should specify an inherent continuous rating, and that's a basic continuous rating with the redundant cooling in service. In addition, you should look at requirements for transient overload, uh, which is a shorter time overload, typically in the order of seconds, and uh, short time overload, which is typically in the order of half an hour to several hours. And uh, the again, with the short time um, overload, there's again the nominal and the inherent, uh, the difference being that the nominal doesn't include the redundant cooling and the inherent includes the redundant uh, cooling. And uh, with an LCC, of course, there's a minimum uh, power transfer, approximately 10% uh, of nominal current, and uh, that implies 10% minimum power at full voltage. 
uh, you can you can do some tricks like operating the poles at, at low low voltage to to get it a, a bit lower but uh, typically you can't achieve zero percent unless you use ground power uh, looking at a vsc system it's slightly different but uh, quite similar uh, uh, again you look at nominal continuous rating that's a basic continuous rating without the redundant cooling uh, inherent continuous rating again the basic rating basic continuous rating with redundant cooling uh, transient uh, over overload rating uh, two second typical but it requires some time delay before it can be repeated and short time rating for instance something like an hour is typically not available with 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 a vsc because uh, it needs to be specified the devices are usually applied at their full voltage and current rating so there really isn't any short time rating in the electronic part of the uh, vsc system unless you specify it and immediately once you specify it it becomes a cost adder uh, so you, you you don't get anything for nothing short time rating costs money with a vsc uh, you can sometimes uh, with an lcc get some short time rating uh, which is relatively cheap but it it it, it, it requires that uh, you you operate maybe uh, or allow some operation at, at slightly higher temperature except some degra degradation and the lcc can do that but a vsc uh, typically cannot and with the LCC, of course, minimum power is zero, and that's easy to achieve. So what are the factors that affect rating, ambient temperature? Uh, normally, you define the rating at maximum ambient temperature. Uh, you may get greater rating uh, uh, possibility at, at low ambient temperature, uh, except if you have cables. Cables are underground, so the ambient temperature range is quite low. And, and Typically, the rain, uh, you don't gain very much uh, when the air ambient temperature changes in terms of rating. So uh, another factor that can can increase your rating is redundant cooling. And, and by redundant cooling, we mean uh, extra heat exchangers and fans. And uh, they would provide increased uh, inherent continuous um, overload and inherent short time uh, overload capability. Their extra cooling is generally not useful for increasing the transient overload capability. That's really uh, a function of the thermal time constant of the cooling of the uh, electronic devices. And uh, so uh, that uh, tends to limit the amount of transient overload you can get. Uh, so uh, uh, if you have some redundant cooling uh, in terms of extra radiator capacity, it, it avoids loss of capacity as cooler e efficiency declines over time. There's always some uh, cooler efficiency uh, loss over time due to internal fouling or, or fouling in the radiators uh, due to dust or pollen or other things. Also deterioration of the efficiency of the, of the radiators. Um, it allows operation to full nominal capacity, even in the event of a pump fan or cooler um, maintenance. And so typical redundancy that might be specified uh, in the cooling system, cooling water pumps, two by 100% capacity, outdoor coolers, uh, depending on the size of the device, you could have two by 100, three by 50, four by 33, five by 25, et cetera, capacity for liquid to air cooling. Fans, you might have one extra fan per cooler. Uh, plate heat exchangers, uh, uh, two 100% capacity deionizer resin tanks for the uh, uh, pure high purity water in, in the, the uh, cool, uh, electronics, two by 100%. Uh, so looking at the impact on rating of uh, um, air, uh, ambient air temperature uh, for air to air cooling and water to water cooling, you see there's, there's a difference. Uh, air to air cooling is by, by the largest, um, most applied technique for HVDC. And you can see that uh, at low ambient temperature, typically you can get something like 10% extra 
uh, if the ambient temperature is below a certain number, uh, which can be specified or, or is typically 20 degrees C. And as you uh, go higher than that, uh, you typically lose uh, some rating as the cooling deficiency, efficiency declines. And the uh, rating is, of course, governed by the hotspot temperatures in your devices and the uh, junction temperature in your, in your, in your um, switching devices. So as the temperature goes up, that uh, junction temperature rises and the, the rating has to go down as the temperature goes up. You can, of course, uh, design to any temperature you want, uh, but then the cost goes up. So, so to get the uh, sort of 110% or, or something, you have to buy extra cooling if, if you would like the overload. So just trying to, this diagram just uh, explains a little bit of the concepts that we had covered in the rating earlier. Uh, assuming that we have uh, prior operation uh, at 100%, and then we uh, have a event which requires overload, we, we can typically get a transient overload, which again was governed by the thermal time constant of the thyristors. Uh, or IGBTs and, and the cooling systems associated with those. And that is really uh, in the one to 10 second range. And uh, it's not adjustable or can't be affected by the uh, redundancy in the cooling. Whereas the short time, rain, uh, short time overload rating and the inherent continuous ratings uh, would be increased if you have redundant cooling compared to the uh, value that you could achieve uh, without redundant cooling, which we are calling the nominal continuous rating. So factors to consider with overload rating. Uh, short time and transient ratings are the design dependent. They need to be confirmed by the designer. They may have a cost impact. It may cause temperature increase above uh, acceptable long-term duration values, and uh, therefore shorten equipment life if you if you do allow a temperature increase. Continuous overload requires some margin in design and in cooling capacity, and uh, we had indicated that earlier. Overload is governed by the most uh, limiting component, so you shouldn't overlook smaller components including bushings, uh, instrument transformers, air-cooled reactors, pre-charge resistors, bus work, uh, any, any little thing that's in the, in the circuit uh, can be, become the limiting uh, component and uh, you know, it can constrain uh, the output or the uh, availability of short-time overload. Uh, so it may be uh, quite economic to, to, to ensure that all of the things are at the same rating or, or have adequate ratings so they don't become limiting. That needs to be discussed and, and reviewed when you're doing your design reviews. Um, dynamic or overload rating, uh, higher overload ratings can increase dynamic over voltages on load rejection. So that could increase costs or could increase over voltages and, and um, limiting those over voltages also needs to be considered in the design. And finally, overload cycles may need to be repeated within a short time, and therefore, you know, overload which uh, has a waiting period before you can use it again is is not as useful as overload which you can uh, use on a repeated basis. Uh, for instance, during DC line faults that uh, may happen, uh, repeated DC line faults that may happen due to uh, pollution or lightning. So if you're looking for a repeatable overload cycle, you need to specify the required repeatability. Uh, repeatability is of course desirable when multiple faults can occur in a short time, such as after reclosing on a AC line fault or having short time, uh, short, uh, short time between DC line faults due to lightning or pollution. The repeatability depends on the temperature rise of the components during any overload cycle. Different um, 
components of different uh, thermal mass and thermal time constants, uh, which are in the order of seconds for power electronic components, tens of minutes for air-cooled reactors, hours for transformers. Cooling time constants are generally longer than heating time constants. This is something which is sometimes not appreciated and uh, in particular, uh, larger components uh, have lo lo much longer uh, cooling time constants than, than heating time constants. You can always heat something up quickly by, by putting a lot of current into it, but cooling has to, it has to uh, occur due to, in some cases, convection to air or uh, convection to soil for electrodes and things like that. And those time constants can be fairly long. So to fully extend, uh, exploit short time overload cap capability on a, a repeated basis, it is usually necessary to use thermal image models of the most uh, limiting components. So the full time overload capability may not be completely used up on the previous cycle. If you have a thermal image model, you, you can remember how much of that capability you used on the previous overload cycle and, and extend this one if you need to, uh, the current overload cycle, or go to the, go to the limit on it if it's, if it's possible. If you have an open loop control where you have a uh, time-based weight between overload cycles, then the inherent overload capability of the equip equipment can't be fully used. Excuse me. <laughs> Uh, so that's covering that's covered rating quite uh, exhaustively. Uh, so we will uh, uh, go on now to performance requirements. Uh, is everybody able to hear me well? Okay, I'll continue. <laughs> so performance, uh, uh, looking at uh, basically three categories of performance, uh, steady state operating requirements, where you're looking at uh, extremes of bus voltage range, extremes of short circuit level, maximum and minimum, extremes of voltage unbalance, uh, maximum unbalance, uh, pre-existing background uh, harmonic levels and for the dan dan on the dynamic side where typically uh, you specify a level of performance that you need in terms of uh, response times fault recovery response uh, uh, damping whatever whatever your performance uh, uh, requirement is uh, as you determine in your studies Typically, you would have a, um, let's say, preliminary performance demonstration during the bid phase, followed by a, a more detailed performance demonstration during the contract phase. Uh, and uh, you, you might include recovery to, uh, response times for step changes, as well as uh, fault recovery times from DC faults or after AC faults. Um, also, uh, you need to specify extreme condition ride through or withstand requirements, uh, and uh, those would include over voltage withstand, low voltage uh, ride through requirements, and off frequency operation requirements. Um, sometimes um, there's also performance requirements in terms of temperature especially if you have extreme temperatures like we have in Canada and I guess you have in India on the other end of the scale uh, you might have you might go from plus or minus 50 or some some other very high temperature range and and those uh, conditions would need to be covered in the spec uh, so let's look first at dynamic performance uh, first uh, look at performance demonstrations during the bid performance uh, during the bid might be optional if the performance uh, requirements is very um, modest. It depends on 
whether or not there are critical performance as aspects that you need to see demonstrated in the bid. And uh, the bid performance uh, requirem uh, requirement ensures that the suppliers understand the specification, understand your performance needs, and uh, it, it serves to um, sort of sort out bidders that may have less uh, understanding or less uh, studies capability. And uh, you can bring all, all bidders to the same level of understanding by including a performance uh, demonstration requirement in the bid. Uh, normally, it's per, uh, performed on a simplified network. Typically, you might have three or three buses per side. Uh, if you have a performance requirement where the uh, DC is embedded in an AC system, you may need to model the parallel AC tie uh, so that the interaction between the two ends can be um, modeled and, and uh, evaluated. Um, the equivalents can be dynamic or static, depending on the objectives. And usually you would include a limited number of cases, you know, probably less than 20 cases, where you define the initial conditions and, and require the cases to be performed. And then you can do a, an evaluation of the capability and, and the performance of the supplier's equipment uh, at the bid stage. In this case, the contractor uses preliminary models of, of its DC converters, you know, obviously not optimized yet, but at least it shows you that uh, the DC will work in, in your case and, and meet your performance needs. So what was a, what would a simple equivalent for bid studies look like? Uh, it usually, as we said, about three buses and uh, if you need the connection to the other side, uh, it'd be the same at each end or similar at each end, uh, uh, adapted from the AC system uh, short circuit levels. And, and if you have a dynamic equivalent, also the inertias of the generators uh, on each side, you might have a typical governor and uh, exciter response in your machine. Uh, the three buses allow you to simulate converter station faults, uh, remote faults at, uh, for instance, bus three in this case, and um, uh, you can model uh, local capacitors and filters for dynamic low voltages. You can model the DC in detail. You can model uh, loads, including dynamic loads, if, if, if those are important for your performance demonstration. So then looking at performance demonstration during the contract, Generally, the system equivalent is larger than, than used in the bid demonstrations, typically 20 to 40 buses at each end. Uh, can include uh, sensitive installations uh, that are sensitive to interaction with the HVDC, such as fast acting controllers, uh, which uh, need to be studied for, for interaction effects. It can include uh, individual generators that have been identified as potentially sensitive to SSDI and then could be used for those SSDI studies. Again, the owner uh, would usually define a larger number of cases uh, with and define the owner the initial conditions under which those cases are to be run uh, to, to demonstrate the performance. And the contractor in this case provides DC models and optimizes the performance prior to delivering the models to the owner. And so typical transfer uh, performance requirements have to be demonstrated over the full bus voltage uh, magnitude and range, maximum and minimum, or normal and extreme. Uh, bus frequency range again up to the extremes, plus or minus frequency steady state voltage and balance for filter performance for end rating. Voltage fluctuations may be specified as well. It's flicker and uh, voltage change on switching of cap banks and or filters. Uh, withstand requirements, uh, over and under frequency ride through requirements, over and under frequency uh, re requirements uh, and ride through withstand response requirements, both large and, and small signal, 
a small signal may be a step response, whereas a large signal may be a fault recovery response, losses and reliability. So supplementary controllers uh, for HVDC systems typically include uh, substance distortional interaction damping controls, uh, power oscillation damping, run back and run up, fast power transfer between poles, frequency limiter controls, system stability controls, uh, which can include generator tripping and system separation relaying, load tripping if the under frequency load shedding is not sufficient, and uh, any system stability controls need to be backed up by system protections, which can include over and under voltage and frequency protections. Now, supplementary controllers are generally identified and defined by the owner, uh, not the contractor, uh, in his studies and, and then included in the specification. You can allow provision for supplementary controllers uh, even if the owner hasn't completed the design at the time of specification. But uh, then you don't get the uh, functional uh, versions of those controls, only the, the um, let's say, skeleton, so you can build a controller later once the studies are complete. And the supplier can't predict what, what supplementary controls that you need. Those are some things that the owner has to specify. And you also need to specify the system conditions under which the performance needs to be met. And now just looking at some uh, typical uh, performance requirements that, that uh, 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 you know, are specified, uh, for in this case, voltage change on switching or, or other um, events. And you see that for infrequent changes, the system impact can be larger or longer than uh, for frequent changes. Uh, withstand and ride through requirements are very important, especially if the DC is providing capacity. The DC system has to meet, as a minimum, the requirements of the grid code. And in some cases, the grid code is a mandatory requirement, uh, even a legal requirement, such as the European grid code, and I've left you a, uh, a link there to, to have a look at a typical requirement of this one, in case this one is the legislation in Europe. Where the, uh, if the HVDC represents a major source or load in the AC system, the owner may specify requirements which are actually higher than the grid code, for, for some of the uh, performance uh, requirements, such as the low voltage ride through transient and temporary over voltage withstand of the equipment, off frequency withstand of equipment, maximum negative sequence voltage or voltage on balance, and higher low voltage uh, operational extremes, which can affect temperature rate, uh, sorry, arrest ratings and tap, tap range requirements and the owner should in define what the requirements are in his studies and, and include them in the specification. And here is some uh, typical low voltage ride through examples. Uh, one in one uh, on the left is uh, something that's uh, defined in uh, typically, we've seen it in specifications in Europe and it derives from power withstand or withstand requirements for and renewable generation such as wind generation but you might uh, decide that uh, you know you want something a little more severe and you might uh, require quite a long ride through requirements such as something on the right uh, where you, we've shown three three seconds at zero voltage followed by 80 percent voltage for quite a long period of time 900 seconds and followed by continuous at 90 percent and that has been specified in, in some cases but that depends on what your requirements are uh, some of it costs money and and so definitely you should be careful and work uh, specify what you need and not over specify it Similarly, with over voltage withstand capability, uh, this is a typical um, requirement. So 
over voltage of 1.3 for 250, 1.2 for 500, etc. And typically these requirements are are there because you want to have the volt the equipment ride through uh, events that uh, can happen following a loss of a single pole and you may get some severe over voltages and you want the other pole to ride through that. Uh, uh, and, and so this is an important uh, part of the specification. <laughs> Similarly on off, uh, off frequency. And uh, the, the two lines in the center of the figure are uh, plus or minus uh, some value around your, your nominal frequency which can be 50 or 60. We've shown 60 in this case, but it's also applicable for 50 Hertz. And then uh, again, the uh, requirements for off frequency operation uh, can affect uh, equipment uh, ratings, particularly filter ratings. And generally uh, it's not enough to just, even a curve like this can be easily misinterpreted in a spec. So generally, we we include as a as a, some text that describes that. Uh, uh, for instance, in this case, uh, the off frequency operation must allow for plus or minus three hertz for for ten seconds, followed by uh, plus or minus two hertz for five more seconds, followed by plus or minus one one point five hertz for three hundred seconds, followed by um, continuous at half, plus or minus half a hertz. And, and it's important to specify that because uh, someone may just uh, say, just look at the first first part and say plus or minus three hertz for 10 seconds or, or, or you know, a part of 10 seconds is all I need to look at. But really you want to look at something which includes the com uh, cumulative duration. And this is, uh, example of a more restrictive off frequency limit and you can see that here uh, they've defined both the plus and minus range and uh, said that if you're between 51.5 and 52 at, at least 15 minutes each time the frequency goes over 51.5 and so on and so on so uh, you, you you need to specify what you want it will affect the equipment design and will have some costs but uh, if you need it uh, by all means, specify it. Uh, specification of response uh, time. Response time really uh, includes both small signal and uh, large signal response. The small signal is typically the step response to uh, uh, of the controller to a step input. It generally refers to a small signal change, one to two percent of nominal. Uh, whereas full power recovery following faults is a large signal response. Uh, with an LCC system, only active power recovery is specified. With a VSC system, both uh, active and reactive power recovery can be specified. Uh, converter balance and uh, power balance and reactive power recovery. Uh, our active power recovery usually take precedence over reactive or AC voltage recovery. So therefore, and uh, those uh, converter balance and active power recovery, when they do take precedence, means that it may not be possible to provide over voltage suppression together with rapid active power recovery. So the two may be uh, mutually exclusive. So you have to decide which one should be prioritized and, and specified accordingly. So we look now a little bit at contractor studies. The contractor also has to do some studies and uh, we'll see what those are including. Uh, contractor studies are associated with DC equipment and DC substation, not usually AC perf system performance, but can include AC system performance if you specify it. So basically contractor study included DC main circuit design studies, um, insulation coordination, AC filter performance and rating, DC and PLC filter performance and rating, loss calculations and loss measurements later, uh, valve cooling uh, system design study, breaker and switch duty design uh, studies, 
protection algorithms and settings, SSDI investigations, supplementary modulation design, if you've specified them in detail, as we previously noted, AC and DC coupling studies and mitigation. This could also be an owner study and, and typically is an owner study, but if you haven't done it, uh, uh, can be done as, as a part of the supplier studies. Dynamic performance studies, reliability and availability studies, and audible sound studies. Other design activities of the contractor might include uh, grounding design, uh, lightning protection, seismic design, bus work design, sag tension, cabling, uh, trenches, trays, structures, foundations, buildings, and associated mechanical systems, and the transmission line and the station, if you haven't done it uh, as a separate contract. And system study models, this is an important area to specify because models are always required for the owner studies uh, subsequent to the uh, delivery of the HVDC system and for exchange with the transmission system operator. Uh, the models should be specified for the system study programs being used by the owner and the uh, transmission system operator. The TSO generally wants generic models suitable to, uh, uh, you know, available, that are available in commercial software such as PSSE and Date Silent, and uh, doesn't want to worry about spe specific user models if possible. However, the owner may have may want detailed custom models which include better control representation and all the special features of the uh, HVDC link for his own studies. This might require either the source code or at least uh, a full documentation, including block diagrams and, and of all of the functions that are included in the in the um, controllers. And usually both single phase uh, for PSSE and its silent type programs and three phase uh, models for programs like PSCAD or EMTP, EMP PRV or similar uh, are needed. <clears throat> Reliability and uh, for reliability, there's a very good Seagrave brochure, TB590 protocol for reporting the operational performance of HVDC transmission systems. So what are typical reliability and availability indices for HVDC uh, systems? Typical numbers are number of forced outages, less than five per co converter pole or symmetric monopole per year for bipolar, or simultaneous monopolar outages less than one in 10 years, uh, forced energy unavailability less than 0.5% a year, scheduled unavailability less than 1.4% per year, that equates to about a week per poll, and interval between scheduled outages typically one year. Uh, with LCC, you can sometimes stretch it to some, uh, somewhat longer, maybe even two years, but it depends on, on failure rates and uh, well, how much maintenance you can perform online and uh, thus reduce the workload in the annual outage. So what are the factors which affect uh, reliability and availability? Uh, well, first one, of course, is quali quality of the equipment and design, redundancy of equipment, overload capability, the capability to operate in degraded modes, which gives you partial capability. Uh, for instance, either with one pole out, one, uh, AC or DC filter in or out, outage of one of two smoothing reactors, etc. It may require uh, additional uh, extra switches to or extra equipment to be able to operate in the degraded modes, but it may be worthwhile, so you should consider that when you're doing your specification. Uh, availability uh, or reliability also depends on whether you have major spares on site or any spares on site, as well as the mobilization response time of the repair teams. Uh, looking at quality of equipment, not all equipment or factories have the same quality, and uh, 
high quality requires a careful specification of the requirements by the owner, uh, pre-qualification of the factories by the owner, development and adhe adherence to the quality plan by the supplier, and monitoring of designs and design reviews by the owners, and witnessing of type tests and some routine tests by the owner. It, uh, I think, is a waste of money to uh, specify type tests and then not go and witness them because uh, you, you could just as well in that case accept an existing type test. So uh, when you're when you're looking at what you need for quality control, if you specify new type tests, you should be witnessing them. Uh, the thing to remember is new type tests are not free. They will they will increase the cost, and if you don't witness them, all you get in the end is a is a is a certificate with a check mark which says passed, and you don't know anything of how your equipment performed during that test uh, at all. So, really, uh, not much value for the money. And uh, including you know, finally, you know, quality control. Uh, inclusion of penalty for for not meeting reliability uh, or having failure uh, rates uh, doesn't compensate for the owner not participating in the design review and, and, and tests. It's really a good idea to, if you are do have a contract which allows you to participate in, in, in uh, design review and approval to really follow that up and, and it's a good training opportunity as well as uh, ensuring that the quality goes into the, the, the installation. Uh, redundancy of equipment, uh, we've already looked at this to some extent, so I'm just going to skip over it. Uh, again, uh, redundancy of equipment does let give you some better reliability or better capability, especially in, in case of partial outages. Uh, for instance, redundant uh, controls, redundant comp uh, protection systems, redundant filters, uh, reactive compensation allow you to operate to full capacity even when there's some equipment that is out. Uh, uh, major spares can have a major impact on reliability. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, for transformers, uh, repair or replacement could take 9 to 12 months. And that can really uh, reduce the availability and, and really put you at a disadvantage financially if your facility or a pole of that facility is out of uh, out of operation for that long. The owner should review re uh, failure statistics, uh, mean time to, uh, be between failure and mean time to repair, uh, published by Segre and other organizations to assess the value of having the major spares. And that should be done before you complete your specifications so that uh, you can uh, decide whether you want to include the major spares in the spec. Usually it's cheaper to buy them in the, in the, in the spec rather than later. Uh, on the other hand, if you, if you find that the possibility of failure is so low that uh, you can uh, absorb the risk, uh, of course you can save some money. And uh, one of one of the tools for looking at uh, whether it's uh, any value in having major spares is is the is the cost of uh, undelivered energy, and uh, it's really based uh, as the same as the cost of losses, and and that can help you evaluate uh, whether or not having major spares is worthwhile. Uh, look at emissions. Uh, how am I doing for time? Anyway, uh, so some major emissions that need to be specified, uh, audible sound uh, or noise, uh, harmonic currents and voltage, PLC frequency interference, radio frequency interference, electric and magnetic fields and ion currents, uh, wastewater from evaporative cooling, if applicable. Uh, usually you don't have a evaporative cooling, it's not specified except in very hot climates. Uh, uh, if, if it is a, uh, provided, then you need to deal with some issues which we'll go into. Uh, so for audible sound, uh, audible sound can be a very large problem. Many jurisdictions uh, jurisdictions follow WHO um, noise guidelines, uh, and there is a publication for Europe uh, which shows the typical levels are uh, 60 dBA, 
at the receptor location uh, during the daytime. Nighttime can be very much lower at 40 dBA. Those are very difficult to achieve. Uh, you need to consider that in your site selection. You need buffer zones to uh, receptor locations, typically for people's houses uh, where people are sleeping. Uh, best uh, way to achieve low, no uh, low noise is to use low noise equipment, which can mean slower speed fans, uh, reduced noise transformers. Mitigation is always the last resort. Uh, it always costs more than putting in quiet equipment to start. Harmonic emissions. Uh, generally in accordance with uh, the latest version of the uh, grid code applicable to the location uh, if, uh, or IEC standard 6101, 6101-3-6, IEEE 519 in North America or a national standard if applicable. Typical performance limits uh, for distortion less than 1%. Uh, Total harmonic distortion or effective distortion uh, of all harmonics, 2% to 3%. And total harmonic form factor, typically 1%. Uh, those are typical for HVDC systems. Current-based limits, such as total demand distortion or IT, are not often applied for HVDC, especially in mesh systems where measurements are difficult to, uh, to do. Uh, with one exception, uh, current-based criterion, equivalent disturbing current, has been uh, up until this date uni universally applied for HVDC line uh, uh, interference, uh, telephone interference uh, evaluation, and that's discovered, uh, discussed in, in a uh, new uh, Seagrade technical brochure, 811, uh, which you can refer to if you. It's a very large uh, technical brochure brand new, uh, which you can refer to when you're looking at uh, equal, um, t line, telephone interference from DC lines. Power line carrier interference, again, uh, power line carrier is declining in use. It has low, uh, because it's got low bandwidth, relatively high cost. It's usually used uh, most often as backup to primary communications, which can be fiber optic usually or, or microwave. Uh, it's easier to filter at high frequencies, and I've given or we've given a uh, typical characteristic uh, for the specification, uh, which corresponds roughly to what you would expect from corona noise uh, from high voltage lines. Uh, so basically, we're expecting that the DC is not going to exceed uh, corona levels uh, of high voltage equipment. One thing that uh, also needs to be specified for the DC line is magnetic and electric fields and ions. Magnetic field is usually not an issue for DC overhead lines. Fields similar and typically smaller than the terrestrial magnetic field. Magnetic fields from cables, however, need to be considered in view of the shorter separation distance uh, because cables uh, typically get buried only a few meters underground. Uh, electric fields from DC lines are quite restrictive, and recent changes to international guidelines have actually reduced limits, so it's become quite a lot harder to, to, to meet guidelines. Uh, two components of the electric field from the line, this is a static field and a space charge field due to the charged ions uh, that are released from the uh, conductors, uh, especially under inclement weather or wet weather conditions. And the total field is called, or enhanced field, includes the, uh, the net field from both the static field and the space charge field. And also, in, in some jurisdictions now, ion flow may also uh, raise public concern, uh, but there's no under international standards or limits at the moment on ion flow. Just an example of uh, recent uh, changes to uh, Electric field limits, and you'll see that for IEEE uh, uh, C95.1 2019, uh, you now have a, for persons in unrestricted environment environments, uh, 5 kV per meter limit on, on, on the, uh, on, under the DC line. And for persons in 
unrestricted environments. Uh, they actually give a, um, already any, uh, a relaxation of that to 10 kV per meter. And, uh, you know, so that is quite restrictive because most uh, existing lines are designed between 25 and 40 kV per meter. And uh, so uh, it's something to be aware of when you're specifying your 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 DC line uh, that uh, recent uh, recently the uh, limits have been going down and design is going to need to accommodate for that. And usually the, the fix is to increase the height of the conductors. Uh, wastewater, we uh, won't spend any time on. Uh, water needs to be treated uh, to re remove minerals. Uh, chemical treatment is needed to avoid mold growth. Significant volume uh, of polluted backwash water may be produced. Uh, maintenance is higher than with dry coolers. Dry coolers are the most frequently uh, used coolers. Uh, they're fully adequate and preferred in, in temperate climate. They may not be completely effective in, in very hot climates and uh, therefore uh, still may find some use uh, for evaporative cooling. Commissioning, trial operation and performance verification. Uh, commissioning should just, uh, generally follow existing uh, standards and guides with possible supplemental tests defined by the owner or contractor to reflect the project specific requirements if there are any. And there's a listing of standards and, and um, testing requirements for HVDC uh, systems uh, given there, uh, both from IEEE and from IEC, as well as some Seagray uh, uh, technical brochures that uh, cover the subject. Any uh, special DC AC integrated system performance tests may need to be defined by the owner, may not be included in those standards and need to be agreed um, by the um, owner and the um, HVDC contractor at contract time so that uh, it's sure that they can be done and uh, would be done. Trial operation. Uh, trial operation should not be unrealistically long. Two to two to six weeks is, is considered realistic. It's not really a reliability monitoring period. Uh, it's, it's only to ensure that uh, the system can operate reliability for the duration that and, and, and it's considered realistic. Uh, conditions for pass or fail should be uh, the condition and the requirement for restart and repeat should be clearly ident identified in the contract. The schedule needs to allow for trial operation and also some possibility of at least one restart. So, you know, you can't set the COD very tightly uh, or allow that the uh, margin of the schedule to get so small that you can't do a restart of the trial operation. And uh, it should typically precede the, the start of commercial operation to avoid questions of uh, liquidated damages for failure to meet reliability and availability. Uh, verification of reliability, availability, ability performance. Uh, here again, the monitoring should be defined in the specification. Should, um, generally, the terms should follow CGRID protocol uh, defined in technical brochure 590. Useful to have a burn-in period of three to six months prior to the start of monitoring so that you avoid the early failure por portion of the bathtub curb and, and really um, evaluate fairly uh, on the uh, uh, reliability of the, uh, the system. Should be monitored on an annual basis in the performance monitoring period. And even afterwards, uh, we, we encourage all users to, to monitor it on a on an annual basis and report to Seagray so that the Seagray um, um, reliability tracking can be updated and, and new users can, and even existing users can benefit from reliability statistics on HVDC. Uh, remediation procedure for failure to perform should also be defined in the contract with further monitoring period after rem remediation. That can require uh, a minimum three-year monitoring period to allow one year to monitor, some time to remediate, and then 
and possibly two more years of monitoring uh, to to to, sh to show that uh, in fact you got a reliable system in accordance with what you had intended to buy. Such an extended monitoring period beyond the commercial operation date generally requires a performance bond since uh, full payments usually made by that time. Uh, so you have to hold a bond if you want to ensure that the supplier is going to um, be receptive to making further changes uh, to achieve reliability targets. And finally, the objective is to end up with a working system, not liquidated damages. Uh, penalizing the contractor after the fact doesn't give you a good system. So you really want to end up with a, with a good and working system. So it's worthwhile having the remediation done rather than the liquidated damages. Right, with that, I'll finish and uh, open it for questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your detailed presentation on the subject. We will now take a few questions. Participants, the session is open for the questions and answer. You can directly interact with the Mr. Bruno and put your question in a chat box also. Uh, Mr. Bruno, a few, few questions are available on the chat box also. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, well let, let's uh, maybe I can share the chat box. Uh, well, let's say first question in the chat box. Uh, please elaborate on the refurbishment of HVDC link where valves and control and protection are being replaced compared to uh, Greenfield project. What aspects need to be considered, especially for system studies to be carried out? Um, I, I think if the refurbishment of the HVDC system is is quite frequently, uh, people look at what new features can be made available. Maybe sometimes the rating can be enhanced by either increasing the cooling on the transformers or on the uh, on the um, valves. Uh, so. Valve may, may have limited benefit to increase in the cooling, but transformers maybe you can get some more um, longer term over overload. And those aspects uh, should be. Uh, if you do get the overload, then you need to also worry about uh, temporary over voltage. Uh, and, and, you know, there may be other follow on effects. So it really depends uh, on what the studies are showing. Uh, you do need to repeat probably, uh, particularly if you're changing the rating slightly, uh, AC filter studies, um, maybe uh, TOV studies, uh, transient stability studies, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, um, hi, that... this is Joanne speaking. Yeah, I just want to add one more point uh, to this question. Uh, well, typically, uh, when you are uh, required to refurbishment, your AC system has also uh, changed uh, compared to the system when it was initially designed. And uh, so the uh, dynamic performance study uh, is also uh, good to do uh, to confirm the, uh, uh, the controllers can still uh, uh, provide the, uh, the response that to meet your system requirement. Uh, okay, and then there's one more question in the uh, in the um, chat box. Uh, please elaborate on the empirical value for line to ground level increase due to star delta transformers. Uh, I think the thing to re remember with star delta transformers uh, on HVDC systems is they can can have a very high rating in the delta is typically half the rating of the transformer on the DC system in each pole. Uh, so if you have a very large DC system, uh, then you can get a significant increase in the in the line to ground short circuit level, uh, depending on where you were initially, and what the short circuit levels are. I, I, I can't give a, a typical value. Uh, 
uh, that would have to be calculated based on the rating of the DC relative to the rating of the uh, um, short circuit level of the system. I hope that uh, is OK. Question. One more question in the chat box. That is on slide 12. It was mentioned that reduced voltage due to pollution is not applicable for VSC, HVDC, MMC, HB, AC breaker. Please elaborate since such feature is present in VSC, MMC, HB project. OK. Question is available in chat box. Yeah, OK, I'm just looking for slide 12 again. So. OK, so. Um, it's uh, indicated it, it I, I, I am. My understanding is it's very difficult to uh, operate at reduced uh, voltage operation when you have half bridge MMC converters. Uh, it may be possible, but the, the range may be smaller than you would get with other converters. That's why I put a zero there. Uh, and of course, technology is still evolving, so that may change with time. And that's something that should be discussed with the supplier when you're when you're looking at uh, the question uh, or that performance aspect. Uh, OK, there's a last question from the chat box. Can you please clarify in which project 4.5 KV 2000 A IGPT has been used? I don't know that they've been used there yet, but they are now being offered by at least one supplier. Uh, and uh, they uh, will be will be offered on some of the newer uh, overhead line uh, systems with higher power ratings. <clears throat> but to my knowledge, there there's none in service at the moment. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Mahesh, you raise your hand. Is there any question? I'm uh, sorry, I didn't I, I hear the question. Uh, I think there's no question from the participants. Sorry. Uh, sir, actually, the question, question was basically. Uh, Mr. Mahesh, can you fix your question on a chat box? Uh, yes, I'm sorry for the disturbance. Uh, actually, uh, in the on the slide, it was mentioned as 25 amperes. That only we wanted to correct. 4.5 kV and 2,500 amperes. Uh, which which slide was this? Uh, let's go back. This one. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, could you get my question? I mean, a uh, point, sir. Uh, your your question, the twenty five hundred ampere. Ha ha. So we just we were just curious that four point five kV twenty five hundred ampere uh, IGBT in which project it had been used. I, I, I as far as I know, they haven't used up to 2000 amperes in any project yet either but i do know that there are devices available up to that level okay 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 from any specific manufacturer sir we can can it be mentioned or some information my where some information maybe in cigarette or some reference it can be fetched this i when i when i prepared the presentation i just looked online for what igbt voltages might or and and ratings might be available 
Uh, I don't remember which one this was, but I, as far as I know, uh, none of the project has used this higher current rating. You are correct. Okay. I, okay. I, it, okay. Should, it, should, it, should, it shouldn't say in use there. Okay. Okay, sir. For some large project only, just we were curious about this device. Okay, sir. Thank you right. for your answer. Right. And 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 the the six point five kV are, are are I think available up to two kV. Is if I'm not wrong. Okay. okay. Ka. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. So now we close question and answer session for this presentation. At the end, we convey our gratitude again to the dignity for their presence, Mr. Bruno from Canada and Sigre for his presentation and support to Sigre India, Mr. A. K. Arora, National Representative in SCB4 and Executive Director Power Grid for his continuous guidance. Sri A. K. Bhatnagar, Director CBIP and Sigre India. We also once again convey our sincere thanks to all the participants for joining us and we hope to see all tomorrow at 2.40 p.m. for our day two session. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. You're welcome. It was a pleasure to uh, participate in this uh, international tutorial. And uh, uh, if there's any questions, certainly you can contact me directly. Uh, so, sir, can you please? I have one question. Can you please, uh, sir? Can I ask now? Sure, go ahead. Sir, uh, why minimum power transfer that is zero megawatt is easy to achieve in VSC compared to LCC? Sir, could you please uh, explain the reason? Uh, it's because the VSC is is mimicking uh, a generator and the power transfer is achieved by adjusting the phase angle of the internal voltage. So you can easily adjust the phase angle till you get a zero zero power transfer. And you can still, in, in fact, produce reactive power and no real power. Uh, and so VSC is quite easy to control there. But however, in an LCC, uh, as soon as you have any current, uh, you, you want to produce some, um, you're going to produce some real, real power because you can't operate continuously at uh, firing angles of 90 degrees. So, um, Therefore, it's easy to achieve with VSC, but not LCC. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Once again, thanks a lot for your valuable time. Okay. Thank you. And uh, it was my pleasure. And uh, uh, Thank you. So with your permission, sir, can we end this session?